One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Welcome to Security Guy Radio. What's your name, sir? Uh, Rick Carruthers with Galaxy Control Systems. What does Galaxy Control Systems do? Galaxy Control Systems is an independent security management company that, that focuses our attention on building access control hardware and software. So you're the manufacturer? Absolutely. Now that, I haven't had a manufacturer yet. This is interesting, okay. So we got the manufacturer, we got the sales, and we have the integrators. Yes. You do all three. We do not do, we do, not do the direct sales to the customer. Okay. We strictly sell to a dealer, a dealer base. So we are a manufacturer that sells our products to installing integrators worldwide. Okay, and what, do you guys belong to Onvif by chance? We are not on the video side, so Onvif doesn't play into our space. Oh, into it our doesn't space. do, oh, no. that's interesting. I did no, our, our, governing, our governing guidelines that we deal with are UL uh, 1094 and 276. Okay, so biometrics. Yes. We hear a lot about that. You guys do biometrics. We integrate with biometrics. Um, Galaxy prim primarily manufactures the panels and the software. Uh, we're reader independent, so we work with biometric companies such as Sajam, BioScript, uh, others, uh, Suprema from other countries. So to us, a reader itself is more like an input device. Reader's dumb. Uh, the reader's not dumb, but the reader is an <laughs> input device that well, you gives can, us the data can, that I need. Yeah, you can train it and you take your software yeah, and absolutely. you can use it. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it okay. reads the credential, it, it validates the credential, it lets us know who that person is, and then we apply the rules to our software and hardware as this person's been validated, should we allow them in this facility? Now, hit cards are kind of generic, so to speak, right? Yeah, they can be used in a lot of systems. Yes. So we could look at your system that way, that you could plug it into different interfaces. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and, and the, the great thing about our system, which is, makes us a little unique than others, is we don't really mind what type of card credential it is. Most standard, industry standard readers are 26-bit, 36-bit WIGAN, which is the protocol. Right. We can read anything up to 256-bit. No. So to the customer, we're very flexible flexible in the way we operate. Uh, we can have uh, multiple readers, so we can have various fit, bit formats. Uh, let's say a major corporation has three disparate systems around the world, all have different card technologies, all have different that readers. That happens, right, yeah. They can pull a Galaxy panel in, and we can continue to use all the field devices from all. And well, it that's would show fantastic. Up, it would show up on the screen as one, as one transaction. Right. So to, to us, it doesn't really make any difference what that end device is, as long as we get the data we need. So I was talking to an integrator last year, and he said, I think as of 2014, digital had not yet surpassed analog. A lot of analog stuff out there There's still, still right? a lot of analog Old school stuff. stuff right? Absolutely, there's still a lot of analog. What we're seeing in the, in the access control space is you still is, got the wires going to things. You still now? got you still got wires. No, there right. are there are a lot of uh, developments being made in wireless readers, um, and we are interfacing with a lot of good brands that have the wireless readers. Uh, but on the card side of the technology, we are seeing a migration over to the smart cards. Well, we've that's like we, we've seen right? the migration in Europe for the last twenty years. Yeah, yeah why did we wait? Uh, it, 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 I think we we wait because it's an unknown technology to the U.S. market. Huh. It's a more expensive technology. Okay. You're looking at a $2 prox card and a $4 smart card. Yeah. Um, and if you start noticing, our banks are now issuing I chip cards. I just got my first American Express card. And, and it's got chip. a chip on That's it. That's right, first one. Having dealt with Europe in the last 20 years, you don't do a transaction with your debit card that's not chip based. Right. They come to your table, they take your chip, they do the processing at the table so to avoid fraud. Oh, that's a great idea. So uh, that's starting to become more. I think you'll see more of that here in the U.S. to where the, the, the person's not leaving you with your card and, and that's becoming in the access control. We can do so much more with a chipped card. With an access card that only has the coils inside a 26-bit Wigan, you can't put a biometric on the card. You right. can't put a unique pin. So there are storage pockets on those smart cards that will allow you to do more. You can mix your logic access and your, your, your uh, physical access. So what I use to uh, access my computer can be a packet on that chip. Yeah. I can do the same to access the door. So all that can be on one card. So you're carrying this common card that ties in multiple systems in your system. Now, I always cell. argue that uh, old school is not completely bad, right? Well, it's because still. if I integrate everybody now, yeah. and I have a, uh, a, 
graphic user interface to make your stuff work, and I got an API for this guy, and we're all going to roast marshmallows and, <laughs> and sing songs and say, we're all integrated, we'll all work together. If I'm the bad guy and I get in, I only got to get in once. You only right? got to get in one portal. And I'm in everything. Yeah. What do we do inside your software, and maybe in the industry in general, what are people doing to to solve that problem. It's kind you, of a new problem. The, it is a new problem. There's a lot of checks and balances you've got to put in. It falls back into your encryption schemes that you right. put in your system. And as long as all your integrated platforms, and I think the, the whole integration world, there's a lot of buzzwords going around the industry. Yeah, and I learned about four new ones today. Buzzwords take fire. Yeah. And when a buzzword takes fire, it may not be the best thing ever, but you've got a lot of much bigger companies with much bigger marketing budgets than even us that they'll, they'll start this buzzword and then it, it, it resonates with the, with the consulting community. And then the consultants start putting the buzzwords into specifications and next thing now it's a feature you got to have. <laughs> the biggest one that we're... And it isn't even designed and, yet. And you don't even know what it is. <laughs> That's right. The, the biggest anomaly right now is the cloud. Everybody's talking about this cloud-based this or that. And you have gray hair just like I do. Not yeah. as much, of course. Uh, yeah. But what was the cloud before? It was called the it was hierarchy storage management. Absolutely. And the computer at your office was dumb and didn't store a thing on it. There was no hard drive. And you know, if you stole that terminal, it didn't matter because it was locked in the closet somewhere, right? right, right and now right. it's the cloud. It's and magic. It's the, cloud. it's the same thing. There's a piece of hardware somewhere in that cloud. That's right. So whether that hardware is sitting at your facility or is being hosted somewhere, and you and the thing about that I worry about. And we, we offer cloud-based solutions, mm -hmm. we offer apps, we're offering all those because you almost have to, to compete in uh, the you world. Kinda, you do, right. So, but the thing I always wonder, is, and, 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 and having, we're a global company, we're in 48 countries now, we just did a major server farm in Doha, Qatar, in oh, the Middle East, 400 miles from ISIS-controlled territory, and <laughs> GoDaddy is hosting a lot of their servers there that are being routed from the U.S. Yeah. So, I if I was a security it. director, I would want to know where physically my cloud is. Right. And if it is in one of these nations, I mean, India is, an, is a major storage hub for cloud. Russia is a major storage hub. Right. You don't know where in the, in the World Wide Web your stuff's going. When I was and you've got to rely on how, okay, I know how my security is for my facility. What's the security like in the data center that's being, that, that all my data's going there? Well, that all comes back to, and an IT guys likes to say that's an IT security problem. It's still physical security. Right? If it affects physical security, you can't point. You got to get in the door. Two points fingers at the yeah. end of the day. You got to get in the door to work the keyboard. Absolutely, right? and and the and the hackers out there are, are becoming very keen. I would I would imagine if it were me and I was a security director of a major facility, having it in my internal network, having it behind my security controls, that my IT department in collaboration with my security department controlled would be a peace of mind for me. I think that's now, what I'm saying. Now, if you want to do offsite replication. Yeah. Now that makes sense. That's a backup, that's different. And now you could replicate to 10 different sites around the world, and you that could, makes sense. You could replicate to your own corporate site. Absolutely, yeah. and we do a lot of replication, and then you'll replicate something happening in one city to another city. That absolutely makes sense. You shouldn't have your replication on the same site. Now, I never understood some of these cloud, when I left the corporate world as a buyer, cloud was just kind of coming around, right? Mm -hmm. so where's this, where's your redundant server? What do you mean redundant server? Well, we don't have it. We're going to get one, though. When are you going to, you're going to get one? You got to have a redundant server, right? And where's your uh, cloud-based store? Well, that's confidential. Well, guess what? Uh, Disney doesn't want to put anything in your network until you tell me where it is, right? Absolutely. And it probably was in, you know, Russia or something that we didn't know about. Well, and, that, and, that, and as a manufacturer, I mean, we're watching all those emerging buzzwords right. and how that affects us. Do you think you pay attention more than the consumer to that? I, I would imagine. Oh, I think we have to. Yeah. Because yeah. we have to. Well, there isn't something. They shouldn't believe there is, I think. That's my belief, right? Well. So, uh, to me, all security is local, so this might work over here in this area. What but. works fine for the Army will not work for the Marine Corps or maybe That's even right. the Navy. Right. But they're trying to force, you know, everybody in, in, into that, you know, every square peg into that round hole. Without divulging any uh, top secrets, uh, what kind of products do you provide the uh, law, uh, either law enforcement and or military? Well, what we try to do is we try to make we try access control and the software behind it. And what we try to do is we try to follow the trends of the bit formats and, and what the government cards, the common access card are going to do. And then we try to make our product work as seamlessly as possible. Good With example. Their exapping, exa uh, a, good, a, a good example. The, the, the current common access card stores a 200-bit CHUID, or it's an I, you know, it's, it's an electronic ID. Our panel, we have it configured now. We can read up to 256 bits. Okay. So we're, we're exceeding that limit. Some manufacturers can't even get to that point yet. Oh, interesting. All right. So, so that's what we try to do. We try to look ahead, and we design that far in advance. Um, if tomorrow they came out and said it's got to be 300-bit, we could change our firmware tomorrow and have it reading 300-bit. 
So that we're very flexible on that. That's one of the markets you're in. And, and that's absolutely one of the markets, and we try to cater to our customers that demand that. What other type of markets? Uh, other type of markets, pharmaceutical, healthcare, we're very big in the healthcare. K through 12 education. Now, let's is talk very about big. healthcare real quick. They have a lot of policies and rules. Yes. Same problem. Got to keep up with this rule, but we don't have any money to fund it, but we're going to do it someday. It's yes. same kind of problem, right? Uh, the emergence of HIPAA over the last yeah. several years has really increased the amount of security you're going to see in a facility, but it also has increased the, uh, the, the complexity that you've got to do it. Now, does the data for your systems fall under HIPAA? That's an interesting question. Our data, our it's data. It's inside a hospital. It's not patient data, but long, it is a patient walking in. It is there, a patient it? walking in. Yeah. It could probably fall under HIPAA. We do uh, have to get joint, joint commission accreditation, like the facilities. Okay. They have to submit our systems. The fact that we encrypt all of our data with 256-bit AES encryption, once we show them that, and once we show them some of our other government credentials, it normally uh, suits the bill. Now, does your software, your, you have software that manages the data once it's collected, I Yes, assume. absolutely. And the user uses that to absolutely. internally. Absolutely, it's, it's the GUI that they use, correct. Once you walk away from the sale and you're doing the maintenance, I, I've always wondered this, legally, how are you connected to the data, or are you? Or is it once well, it's passed off, is it their data? Yeah, I mean, we have a software license agreement, and once that dealer sells it to the customer, they transfer that software license to them, and that basically it takes the obligation away from the factory. Yeah, and you have the encryption, so you did your job. Yeah, we did everything and we're supposed to do. if they stick it on do. a floppy drive and take it home, If they do fault. something to it, it's, not, do? Yeah, it's not anything yeah. that we can control. Uh, because we basically transfer the ownership of that license to the to the end user. Are you seeing any of this stuff in residential access control? It's not 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 primarily. Not in the states. Uh, in some of the foreign countries we deal in, where you're talking about residential compounds in the Middle East, uh, palaces, yeah. and that we, we do see a lot of access control when they're doing perimeter security. But in the U.S., that's not a big market for us at all. Because you see now we do see a lot of products that are being geared toward taking commercial type products and retrofitting them for the residential market. Yeah. I mean, I recently just upgraded my deadbolt on my house to a keypad deadbolt right. that's battery operated. Now I don't have to worry about giving my kids a key or the guy coming to fix my sink. I give him a code, he punches it in, he walks in the door. Yeah. So there's a lot of that. I think a lot of the commercial stuff is being pushed into the residential space, which is not a bad thing, because I think that's only going to help the commercial world as people embrace it more in their homes then they're going, to, they're going to embrace it in their workplace as well. What do you think is the biggest threat we have right now in security? Biggest threat? Uh, cyber, cyber security. Yeah. Uh, foreign, foreign cyber attacks. I, I mean, I, I think that, that, that there's countries and organizations out there that are doing nothing but employing people to try to crack in. Our products are residing on networks, so right. we have to be careful that, you know, that our portal, any, any IP portal that you've got on a network can be a way into the software. Right. Now, you do your encryption. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, What's that? Uh, how do you do penetration tests on your stuff? Well, one thing you stick something out there. And one and one, try to thing, hack it all one day? thing that we did that we're fortunate of, us being on a lot of the military programs that we're on, the government has a program called DICAP, and DICAP you have to have a DICAP accreditation before they'll allow you to ride on what they call the SIPRNET. and what the SIPRNET is is the top secret network. So they load your software well, and your hardware. Yeah, it's, it's, you just told me about it. Yeah. Well, the top secret network, everybody knows the yeah, I mean, yeah. But so the, the, the software and the hardware that we have and we sell to the government, they have a program that tests us against threats. And basically they'll install us on it and then they'll run this software that just hits pings and threats against us. Yeah. Once you pass that, now my, all my hardware panels and all my software is DICAP approved and we have what they call an ATO, an active uh, authority to operate. The authority to operate means I've been tested, you can put me on the top secret network and you don't have to worry about me being a threat. No, that's good. And and that's with anything. That's your copier down the hall, that's attached, your printer at your desk. Well, Everybody has to go through that dock process. IP, it's all an IP address And now. it's all IP address that's based. Right. It's all computer. So with us having that with the military, that gives us a higher level of assurance on our commercial customers. Right. If they start, if the commercial IT starts asking, what do you do to threat against cybersecurity, we show them the testing criteria. and we don't show them the results of our test because we can't but we can show them the testing criteria the government uses, and 90% of the time that's far more stringent than they can ever do internally themselves. Right. So it brings a level of assurance that if this is good enough to ride on the U.S. military's top secret network, then obviously it's good enough to ride on our corporate account yeah. and our corporate network. So we use that a lot. Name your company one more time. Galaxy Control and Systems. And how do we get a hold of you on the web? www.galaxysys.com. Thanks for talking, it's a good conversation. All right, thank Thanks. you. Beautiful. That was great. Perfect. Yeah, very, very nice. Can, can you put some Looney Tunes? That's uh, <laughs> all, folks. <laughs>
good. Um, Ginger. Yeah. Yes. No, no, uh, Diane. Okay. I was able to reschedule it. Okay. And if Ginger's coming by, if she's walking by Galaxy.